Aha, now, you should be able to hear me. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry about that slight delay. Does it count as a slight delay? Oh, it says 1900 according to my uh, machinery. Uh, so maybe, yeah, maybe we're not doing too badly. Um, yeah, okay, good, good, good. Right, we are here. To, yeah, the sound appears to be working. People can hopefully hear me. I've made myself, let's, let's briefly go big face. I've made myself, uh, all right, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, thankfully the camera's not picking up the fact that I have a big hole on, the, on my chin. There are, these, these may now be somewhat limited edition given that they, there are, I need to abolish the treasury. It's a rail net, a mug. Given it looks like we're not gonna have merch for a little while. <laughs> Anyone who has got a mug has got exclusive limited edition kit. Um, Right, anyway, enough of me waffling away. Let us progress with tonight's episode. Um, so, yeah, a while back, we had, uh, quite a while back, over a year ago, uh, I think it was like April slash May in 2021, we had a bit of a disaster on our rail network. Uh, thankfully, it was one that didn't cause any individuals any harm, at least not directly. Um it was caught before it became a serious issue and actually generally never was never going to become an issue. Uh, yeah, so the um, basically we had a lot of cracks appear in Hitachi strings. In fact, here is here is a, a picture of, of one said crack. Here it is. Um, and these cracks were found on the body of not just the InterCity Express uh, fleet, but there was potential uh, kind of early stage cracking found on other trains within the Hitachi fleet as well. And at the same time, CAF uh, had a load of cracks appear as well, which is uh, on a slightly different part of the train. We're not going to cover CAF today, or uh, or at least I don't think we are. Uh, let's see what the report says, actually, uh, because we're going to look at the report. We're going to look at the ORR report that, that came out about a year afterwards. So it came out earlier this year, um, and it allowed us to... Uh, it, it, it dug into the, the issues, and we're going to have to flick through and hopefully learn something, because I've not looked through this report. This is the first time I'll, this is the first time I'll be looking at it is, is with you, lovely lot. So uh, we're going to do that. We're going to have a look. And we're going to um, cover off, uh, maybe have a think about what uh, what's happened since. Uh, I actually spoke to the ORR um, uh, to get their latest to get the latest line from Ian Prosser himself uh, to see what's uh, what's been happening since the report was published. So um, we shall have uh, we shall and there's all it's going to be a nice relaxed uh, traditional rail matter page turn with all you lovely lot chipping in. Um, and I'm like, yeah, well, let's 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 just get on with it, shall we? Uh, everyone, welcome to tonight's Rail Matter. Before we do anything with uh, with talking about cracked trains, um, let's talk about the COVID stats. So the COVID ridership stats, uh, here they are. Let's see how things are going. Let's uh, also go from mouse to uh, to squidgy doodad. Well, general decline, which is worrying, frankly. There's a definite local trend in, in a decline for, for rail usage. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's, there's just, this isn't good. Now, there's an awful lot of things conspiring on this front. Is it services? Is it cancellations? Is it is it a genuine reduction in the amount of people traveling uh, to see friends, family, you know, leisure and, and kind of basically non-business, non-commuting travel? Is that why? Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to understand the data. Uh, if anyone's got any further insights, I need to, hopefully, someone someone who's there Feel free to send me um, the, uh, if anyone's got hold of the GBRTT um, uh, data, Simon, if you're watching this, uh, uh, if you happen to, uh, you know, uh, have any contacts who might, you might be able to jab, uh, for example, uh, who can send me it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, anyone who's who's in there who has, who has that sort of thing that can uh, send me. 
toms, the various toms of the world who uh, who, who potentially uh, you know have friends in high places. Anyway, uh, all those good people, or Andrew Haynes, if you're listening to this episode, because uh, scarily you you hinted that you might listen to an episode of Rail Matter. Anyway, if you are listening to this one, Andrew Haynes, uh, feel free to send me the GPRTT <laughs> stats, which should be publicly available anyway, really, because it's public data. Um, anyway, right, enough of me waffling. Uh, so generally, yeah, we've got this this trend uh, down, so we've dropped down below eighty uh, percent. Okay, we're gonna. There's, there's a bit of a gap. Let's hope that there's a bit of a gap here uh, of a week of, of unpublished. So let's let's kind of hope that um, that maybe there's there's a, there's a turnaround. But it could be that we're seeing a bit of a decline into winter. We've not really. If we if we jump to the national stats, we've kind of every winter we've seen this this plummet. We have seen this sort of emerging trend of decline. Uh, kind of every winter, but generally those declines were were as a result of of COVID. Is that the case now? I don't know, but it'd be quite interesting to spot if there is a, a kind of a macro trend annually in, in this data because there, there kind of appears to be one. Um, anyway, I'm quite interested by looking at that. Deirdre, uh, yeah, any, anything? Yeah, absolutely. The cost of living crisis, people are cutting back on social spending, people are generally traveling less, people can afford less. There's a lot of other macro effects going on here. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's definitely... There's a lot going on. It's not just the railways, but the railways are causing headaches for themselves. So... Yeah, lots of issues for us to be thinking about. So uh, it's not all doom and gloom, but it's certainly the case that that, that, that ridership is sort of pitched down a little uh, recently. So you know we re- we were reaching the heady heady upper upper ninety percent. We were up 97, 96, 97, 98 percent. Kind of that's dropped away again. So uh, yeah, uh, we shall continue to follow closely and try and understand what that uh, what that uh, actually looks like uh, and what 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 else we can glean from the data. Anyway. We're going to do it. There's no news tonight uh, because, to be honest, I burned out so much. I was collecting so much news up till now that nothing's really happened since. There's not actually been any particular rail news that I've noticed or saved. Um, yeah, the, the, from what I could tell, the, there's, there's a lot of noise at the moment, but there's not a lot. There's a lot of uh, heat, not a lot of light. So let's uh, let's park the news, uh, see if anything picks up next week for us to report on. But um, we're going to dive straight into the report. This is the Officer Rail and Roads. Uh, the, 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 Successor to the Office of Rail Regulation, uh, they they get got to keep the logo very cleverly. Office of Rail and Road, um, uh, and this is the report: Learning Lessons, ORR review into Hitachi AT 200 300 rolling stock cracking. Final report released seventh of April this year. So um, the AT 200 is the um, there's only one fleet of AT 200s I think operating. That's the ScotRail um, intercity fleet, the electric intercity fleet. The AT 300s are the intercity express variants, and also the the javelins, the the southeastern javelins are also AT 300 uh, trains. Uh, someone might correct me on that, but I believe that's true. So uh, let's have a look. Let's do it. Let's let's make the magic happen. Um, I've you might have noticed I've switched me mouse on, so you can see it. Can everyone see that? I know it's very small for those of you watching on a phone or a small screen. Uh, for those of you watching in enormous HD, then uh, you'll be able to see this mouse uh, very clearly. Uh, right, let's let's do it. Let's go through it. Let's, let's, we're going to do it. Let's see. So, uh, what's the structure here? Uh, it's about what is it? It's about a fifty-page report. FYI, there's plenty for us to go through. I, I'm not going to say this is going to be a short episode because it might not be, but we'll try and sift through and go through the salient information and, and pick that stuff up. So, as is tradition, we'll skip the executive summary because we're going to look at the body of the report. So, um, so that's fine. We'll uh, so we'll jump straight to background. So, so that skips ten pages off the bat. Lovely. So, there's the structure is there's an executive summary. There's a, a background chapter, a determination of root causes. Um, uh, there's examination of industry response, and then that's it. Um, it's a shame there's not like a concluding, the chapter structure would maybe have benefited from like a, a kind of a wrap up, but yeah, yeah fine. A, a lot of people are saying they like this report. Um, uh, Rigor Mortis 69 is saying mouse visible. Lovely. Um, and no, I'm not going to sigh and sip my tea every episode. It was just this time, you know, I like to shake things up a bit from, for, for you, um, hardcore fans. Oh, I'll tell you what, it's a nice, that's a nice market. Yeah, it's not a tea actually. It's a, it's a decaf instant coffee because well all sorts of reasons right uh let's do it let's jump straight in let's go to background so as a bit of a reminder for ourselves it's useful to have this bit of background uh when and where cracks were found during scheduled maintenance activities on the gwr class 800 and 802 units cracks were found in the area of the bolster close to the yaw damper bracket and anti-roll bar fixing points that sounds very technical but don't worry everyone we're going to have a look at a picture um on vehicles in these classes in fact we're going to look at this picture now, here is the um, here's the report, uh, and 
Do you know what would be good is if we zoom right in on this, actually. So here is where the cracks were found. So it's on the... So the, the just remind myself exactly what that wording was because I know roughly the the, the, the uh, da, 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 da. so it's yeah cracks found in the area of the bolster close to the yaw damper bracket and anti roll bar fixing points close to the anti roll bar uh, bracket so that's the yaw damper so this is the yaw damper this manages the the rotation the rate of rotation of the um, of the vehicle uh, let's yeah that's probably not a bad little spot to sit this image on but there we are lovely it's almost as if it's a planned slide uh, right so sorry this is a yaw damper um, uh, and this is the anti roll bar assembly so these are the, so the, your you know your pitch and and roll are the various ways in which dimensions in which a, a vehicle can can move uh, there, there are others as well uh, but primarily those ones um, so the yaw damper controls how much it you know, manages hunting uh, and and smooths out tight curves and, and so on. Uh, Gareth Williams, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I am reminding you what the yaw damper does. So yes, yaw damper um, damps out. Uh, so so for tra for trains like these, which are designed for 140 miles an hour, the yaw damper is critical in enabling uh, small movements uh, or or developing hunting to to be limited. So you don't get too many high frequency movements. It kind of generally damps those movements to be lower frequency, which is better for high speed running. It means they don't run quite so well at, at lower speeds. Um, it means that you get a little bit more friction, a bit more more kind of nosing forces at the wheel. Um, as it goes around tight curves, uh, but that's not such a big deal when that's not most most of what it's doing is going fast along fast track, so that's fine. Uh, the anti roll bar is about managing the amount. If you can imagine, we're looking straight towards the train, the amount the body is rolling about. So again, it's managing that 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 behaviour. Uh, but that's less about damping. That's more about managing. Uh, that's that's more about sus the, the general uh, kind of uh, rolling suspension. Mechanical engineers can. Uh, can, can uh, come back to me on that one. So, um, we have, uh, so Matt Reed's asking where the cracks found during routine maintenance. Yes, they were, yeah. Uh, the anti pendolino bar, uh, says Michael C. Yes, absolutely. So, um, the cracking was found up here, actually, in this position here. So, this is the bolster assembly. Bolster is the, the name of the connection between the bogey. This big thing here is a bogey. In, in, uh, the, in North America, they call them trucks. Uh, in the UK, we call them bogies. Um, because we're uh, gluttons for punishment. The bogey can, uh, is what hold, holds the axles to the train. Um, and the bolster assembly, the bolster is essentially that connection. It's the name of the connection. It's like a bit kind of, it, to all intents and purposes, it's a vertical tube or a cylindrical uh, kind of thing that allows free rotation of the, or reasonably free rotation of the bogey. Uh, but kind of also, certainly in modern trains, uh, Minim, it kind of manages the vertical suspension and stops the bogey from flying off if there's a crash as well. So you've got both bolster assembly, lovely, um, and you've got uh, on this side you've got this kind of complex bracket that's designed to to hold the. So you've got the the, the mounting and then the bracket here which holds both the anti roll bar and the the yaw damper. It's important to go into this detail because this is uh, very specific. Uh, yes, this was an invention of Dr. Alan Wickens who will absolutely who is still alive and I would love to talk to for a rail matter. Um, uh, yes, uh, perhaps his. I think his daughter is uh, is also around and, and a railway adjacent and is lovely. Um, apparently, very uh, very friendly and 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 but aware of her uh, father's uh, accomplishments. So yeah, uh, anyone who knows Dr. Alan Wickens uh, or family, uh, reach out. Actually, I know that Bob and Aunt Cool, Bob Gwynn and Aunt Cools do. So um, yeah, watch this space. Anyway, so all that stuff's happening in this kind of quite complex bit of metalwork here that's then welded it's, it itself is then welded to the to the broader body frame you can see there's this reinforced lifting plate over here for lifting the the, the vehicles up the bodies up so this is this this kind of quite complicated bit of metal but it's not the, the, the section here is not necessarily load where the cracking is happening it's not necessarily load bearing anyway we'll we'll, we'll get to that let us let us continue uh, to the point where I'm actually just going to control L this again, so it's just full screen again because it makes my life easier. So, uh, yes, it was during scheduled routine maintenance. So, um, on the 11th of April 2021, GWR issued a notice um, um, uh, in accordance with the standards uh, describing the yaw for cracks. The cracks were initially suspected to result from fatigue, which was subsequently confirmed by technical investigations. So, they knew that it was fatigue pretty early on. Um, eight significantly affected trains were withdrawn from service. So, so pretty rapidly there was a withdrawal of service. A month later, 
Uh, further cracks were identified in the vicinity of the weld lines where the lifting plates attached to the vehicle body. So there, there, there was yaw damper cracks and then there were lifting plate cracks, two separate cracking, uh, uh, cracking situations. So uh, the prevalence of these cracks... Um, Oh, actually, sorry, forgive me. Let's go back to paragraph 2.3 because this is relevant. Um, initial assessment concluded that there was a risk of the lifting plates detaching. That's pretty massive. The prevalence of the cracks on many vehicles in both the GWR and LNER fleets resulted in the decision on the 8th of May to withdraw all Class 800, 801 and 802 rolling stock from service until each had been checked and a case for safe operation of vehicles with cracks had been made. That's the yikes moment. Um, withdrawing an entire fleet, uh, or rather, you know, three entire fleets is is a bold move that's 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 a serious squeaky bum uh, alteration in trouser color type um type move to, uh, to be made so uh, yeah quite quite a quite a drastic move um and so what what are the trends that were actually um oh actually before we say anything more than that let's just let's just kind of finish this so the the uh, gdr issued a particular notice um, uh, which described the lifting plate cracks. The cracks were initially suspected to result from stress corrosion cracking, which was then confirmed by the technical investigation. We will come back and talk about stress corrosion cracking momentarily. Um, the Hitachi 8T200-300 trains uh, affected, while there were the uh, L- LNER, GWR, Transpennine, and Hull, Southeastern run the, the Javelins, um, Scotrail that operate the AT200s, uh, and LUMO, uh, currently LUMO, all of them have 8200 or 8300. Well, most of them have 8300, and Scott really have 8200s. Um, so, yeah, there we go. 8200 uh, refers to the class 385s. Lovely. Um, and then the 8300 covers, um, yeah, the class 395s, and then all of the, um, the 800s, 801s, 802s, 803s. So, um, there we go. So, that's, that's all of that fleet. Um, for clarity, the, eight, the class eight hundreds uh, are the class eight O Xs are being referred to as class eight O Xs. Well, I think everyone on this call will be familiar with that um, way of referring to them. So the eight O Xs is how I'm going to refer to the the uh, uh, the eighty three hundreds that aren't class three nine fives. Um, yeah, so the, it's worth so these trains are manufactured from a combination of um, aluminium alloys, or if you're North American, aluminium alloys. Um, no, uh, aluminium alloys, uh, which Hitachi describes as having a proven track record across various train designs and in other industries, including marine, defence and aerospace. So these two different 6,000 and 7,000 series uh, aluminium alloys. 6,000 is medium strength, 7,000 is high strength. Um, 7,000 series uh, alloys, aluminium alloys, provide the benefit of high strength, enabling weight reduction within the design. Um, they're stronger, ostensibly stronger material then you can reduce the, the, the thickness the panel thickness um, which enables you to reduce weight which is good reduce mass uh, car body is assembled by welding together basic aluminium components to form the structure uh, okay fine so that's just talking about how the the, 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 the structure is formed it uses um, metal inert gas and friction stir welding techniques we will get a welding expert on here at some point I actually have a welding book behind me I have the PWI welding book somewhere what is it uh, there, understanding rails and rail welding. I'm not sure to go into detail about uh, welding aluminium, though, because aluminium welding is quite specialist. Uh, da, da, da. Any rail vehicle body requires additional strength in the areas where bogey loads are transferred to the body shell, uh, and this is achieved by welding additional structural components in the part of the body shell above the bogey. Um, this strengthened area is referred to as the bolster, because it bolsters the strength of the body, right? Is that right? I don't know. Is that where the name comes from? Uh, Adam Evans says 6,000 bendy iPhone, 7,000 non-bendy iPhone. Thank you. Um, uh, Tom is uh, enjoying a conversation on stress corrosion, cracking over a glass of whiskey. A great way to spend an evening. Well, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, uh, whiskey would also be nice, but uh, I'm going to suffice. It's quite cold in this room for various reasons. Well, mostly because we haven't switched the heating on yet. Uh, so I'm enjoying this warm coffee. So, um, yes, so we, we've talked about this picture. Lovely. Um, and... So there's the, the background is that then so these these trains were withdrawn. Um, there was a, a kind of a Hitachi initiated meetings with lots of stakeholders, as you would imagine. So fine, Hitachi clearly wanting to just solve this problem. Uh, uh, the, the NERIF, the Northeast Rail Engineers Forum, um, quite recently was uh, well worth an atten- uh, attendance for for those. For, for, keep an eye on it for next year. Uh, I, I am the chair of NERIF. Um, and um, we had quite a lot of well, it was quite a rolling stock theme nerf this year, although we usually try and balance it out. But we had, you know, we had Hitachi staff 
there or ex Hitachi staff, but but it was quite. A, it, it's interesting because the Hitachi UK culture seems to be quite open. I know there are commercial barriers and boundaries, but but it seemed they seemed quite open. I mean, for example, the the chap who was there, um, who uh, now works for LNER, uh, he was being very open about the problems they've had with the IEP uh, fleet. Um, uh, at LNER, uh, not including this, um, and how they've resolved them. So it's really genuinely interesting. So that's so that's good. Um, anyway, sorry. So they had all sorts of stakeholders, both in the UK and Japan. So the operators, Roscoe's, uh, you know, the rolling stock operating companies. Um, they had um, technical consultancies. I, I know a couple of consultants who were in that call. The RSSB, the Railway Safety and Standards Board, uh, the DFT, and Officer Rail and Road. Uh, these meetings provided a forum for attached to present activities it was undertaking. Glorious. Okay, fine, fine, fine. So they developed this stuff, continued to share with stakeholders, uh, lots of meetings using video conference, um, uh, and uh, that was fine. Uh, occasionally had physical meetings uh, at the at North Pole, which is where pretty much all the GW, well, all the GWR IPs are, are based, which is where they're doing a lot of the, the investigation, actually. That's where they're doing a lot of the investigation there. So initially they were trying they tried to define acceptable criteria to get the trains running, returning to service, back into service, right? So it was working out, right, what, what cracks are safe so we can get most of the fleet back? What cracks do we think are too much? So that, that was kind of what they, they then developed. Um, but it was, the trouble was that it was very difficult to actually, particularly with the, um, uh, the yaw damper cracks, uh, they found it very difficult to understand um, where those limits were. They found it quite difficult to analyze that. So, um, so they then thought, right, okay, we'll forget the yaw damper cracks. We'll just look at the lifting plate cracks and, and understand those parameters and get those into service quickly. So um, so that was fine. So the initial proposals, including measurement of crack sizes, but that became very difficult to do accurately. So they decided to just say, is there or is there not a visible crack? And that was the, that became the, the kind of the, the, the criteria, if you like. Um, so, um, so the Welding Institute got involved. Ricardo Rail uh, got involved. Rod Smith of um, ICL uh, of Imperial got involved. Um, SNC Lavalin, um, uh, possibly X Atkins, but anyway, the SNC Lavalin got involved, um, and uh, First Group uh, got involved. Their engineering organisation. So lots of people getting involved. Lots of stakeholders. This is actually a remarkably good news story. Okay, so there are clearly issues with the, with the trains that result in this, and we'll get to that. But actually, this this was an a really impressive effort to get things get trains back into service again like the reality is there's my understanding from people working within this is that it was a, a genuinely uh it was it was crisis mode but it was i'm sure there was some caginess here and there in it actually given the implications but actually it was let's get these trains back into service if we can let's work out the problem and there's a lot of good collaboration um, as a result of that um so uh tom is saying grinder and paint makes me the welder i ain't um, <laughs> yeah, that's quite good. I like that. Very nice. Uh, yeah, keep chucking me um, questions and thoughts by adding my name in, folks. Uh, those of you who are new to episodes, uh, welcome. Welcome to all the many people watching. Um, so, uh, the operators understood that they were responsible as safety certificate holders to, to, to actually decide whether or not to operate trains. So, they were looking at for, they were looking to be informed by Hitachi as the builder and, and, and their maintainers and, and these consultants. But ultimately, it was the train operating companies that where the buck stopped with risk. Uh, and with, if something happened, they would be the ones who'd be responsible. So, um, so they then, so the ORR just point out that they were able to demonstrate how they'd applied their own safety management systems um, and, and make uh, and proved that they could make that decision to, to get trains running again. Uh, Hitachi were developing inspection processes. So lots of lots of stuff here um, uh, about kind of how how the problem began to be solved. Um, so that's good. So so ORR structured their review uh, to look at the a technical review including the root cause analysis to how it was rectified and, and what the progress is on, on modifications and uh, and the capability of uh, operators safety management system, SMS safety management system, not SMS text, uh, to manage the withdrawal and reinstatement of vehicles. So two quite interesting kind of thoughts. So, the, so what what was the engineering issue uh, that, that caused the issue, the problem? And how did the safety management system um, successfully process the trains through ah we have a problem right let's stop the trains running to let's get the train starting to run again so let's uh, let's have a look so 
there's, there's a kind of a general collection of evidence that was done. So we can kick off with the determination of the root causes. So there's a bit of just discussion here about how do we do this? Fine, fine, fine. So yeah, simple pass fail visual inspections. Fine, fine, fine. Um, evaluation of potential crack growth was required in order to support the case of return to service. So this included theoretical propagation mechanisms. So using kind of fatigue cracking. I've got a big book on fatigue cracking somewhere. Where is it? No. Where is it? It's in here somewhere. Uh, no, no. It's around, it's definitely around here. Ah, here it is. Stress analysis of cracks. The handbook. Do you want to see it? Do you want to, do you want to, do people want to see this? this? This is quite good. It's, uh, it's quite large. Oh. Oh. Here is uh, the stress analysis of cracks, which uh, I made use of, uh, unfortunately, after my thesis. I didn't realise it. it was too expensive for me to get hold of. But it is a, I mean, I'm not going to say I flick through it regularly, but it's it has... It has information. It's it's a so the point of me getting this book out. I mean, no one involved in this may have looked at this, although I bet they did because this is a bit of a bible. Um, but this is a chunk. This is a right old chunker you know, compared to the size of my chin, for example. My chin is uh, an abnormally large uh, edifice, and yet you can see this is about the size of my chin. So that's uh, that's, that's that's the it's like uh, football pitches, elephants, double decker buses, whales, and my chin. Uh, all combined. Anyway, uh, so that's the sort of thing that you use to uh, evaluate um, kind of the theoretical side. And then they measure the propagation rates as well. So there's the theoretical side and then you validate. It's just like any good science. You, you, you take the theory, best, best theory that you can get hold of, and then you validate that using real measurements. Um, so that's how they did it. But they also use structural analysis. So they then started going into detailed finite element analysis. You've seen pictures of finite element. I'm sure all of you have. It's the pictures where you've got the whole thing is mostly maybe blue or a neutral colour and then you have a hotter bit around a stress concentration and you might see bridges deflecting or all sorts of different things with finite element analysis. You might have seen like pictures of you can sometimes see to rail the rail with a with a, a the kind of the hot spot with the blue around it. Um, finite element analysis. You can Google it and, and see lots of pictures and you'll go, oh yeah, that, I have seen pictures of that in places. So uh, that's a, it's a process of creating a computer. In fact, I was, Alex Chum at work today was, was doing some FEA and I was I went around and chatted with him about it because uh, he uses a lot of programming uh, to, to do a lot of the stuff rather than just relying on the software, which is quite, and the interface of the software, which is quite cool. Anyway, that's another story. Get Alex on to talk about that at some point, maybe. Anyway, um, so there's a discussion about what was happening. The principal, you know, the team at Casado undertook their own analysis. Um, that was them using the original vehicle models, so you know their, their actual CAD design of the of, of the original vehicles, um, and then uh, kind of modi modifying those against um, what the vehicle operation, you know, measured data from vehicle operation, um, and it looked at various bits and pieces, particularly though looking at the anti roll bar and the yaw damper forces. So obviously the, the the forces from those are quite complex, and they needed to understand and, and model them. Um, a little bit of weld quality, lots of things. So fine, lots of analysis. Uh, strain gauge testing. So uh, this is where you fit a little thing that, that looks at uh, how much movement there is. And, and, and that movement allows you to understand the stresses uh, kind of going through a particular uh, element. So they, uh, what's fun is that they were running trains fast. They ran trains up to 140 miles an hour um, to kind of uh, test a little bit more of an extreme range of operation. So that's fun. So there's some fast trains running about. Um, Tom, Tom, uh, that's a fun idea. Yes, maybe. Uh, Discord server. Sorry, Tom is asking. Me, it, Tom is distracting me with segues on. Can we get an engineer play series on one of those bridge builder games? Yeah, we, we probably could. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. Testing was conducted with vehicles uh, empty, and then uh, loads of ballast put on board to be fully loaded. So crush, so tear and crush loading conditions. Uh, repeat with new worn wheels. So they started doing some very some pretty exhaustive test, physical testing of the trains, including high speeds. Uh, the testing has recorded higher loads from the yaw damper and anti-roll bar than had been expected at the design stage and informed by the testing carried on the first vehicles of the production run. That's interest. That's very interesting. That is an interesting point. Okay, bearing in mind I'm reading this uh, as you are as well. Uh, Rigor Mortis, who's a photographer, by the way, folks, uh, amongst other things, um, got some photos of the, of the trains um, doing their... 140 mile an hour testing, cool. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. So so this is a really key point. Higher loads from the yaw damper and the anti-roll bar than expected. That's very interesting. Uh, so there's these kind of, the short term repair processes sort of informed um, the kind of the technical, you know, the, the, the understanding of the technical issues. And then there's a load of other assessment that happened. So there's the, the lots of activities by, so Hitachi asked RSSB to assess the risks associated with the cracks. 
Um, uh, so RSSB organised workshops. They got Ricardo, TWI involved. Um, that's the Welding Institute, by the way. It's like it's like the permanent way institution, except it's the, it's not the PWI, it's the TWI. Uh, sought to assess the the potential failure modes. Okay, fine. Um, and then the second workshop was with operators. So lots of different ways of collecting information. Um, but that's what's informed this report, really, is that the, the different uh, scientific assessment, you know, that, that, that engineering scientific assessment. Fatigue is a mechanism whereby cracks develop and grow. Have I got anything that I can fatigue before your very eyes in front of me? Give me a second. Oh, no, I've wired myself in. I couldn't do it. If only I brought a paper clip within, within arm's reach. Have I got maybe a uh, stapler? I should have thought of this, shouldn't I? Get a little, uh, little stapler, maybe, something like that in front of me. No. No, I can't spy anything that I could cause physical damage to before your very eyes. Um, but if you can imagine... Oh, there must be something in there, dear. What have I got? Oh, maybe I can detach this safety pin from... Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to detach a safety pin from a... I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen. Uh, here we go. If I do this and then do this... Don't mind me, I'm just physically breaking a thing. Ugh. Well, okay, right, forget it. Here, I have I have got, let's go big face. I'm gonna show you fatigue cracking in action. Here is a safety pin on the back of this badge uh, from a from the Young Railway Photographer of the Year event, which was nice, there we go. Anyway, uh, here is the, the, the safety pin. Here you can see the safety pin. Fuck, I'm gonna put it here, there's the safety pin, very nice. Now, if I if I take the safety pin and, uh, and, and bend it, you see, well, it's, it's metal, it's very strong. If I try and pull it, it's very, very strong. But if I, I mean, it's already, hilariously, it's already just fragmented. I don't know if you can see that. Wait a minute, hold that there. It's already just, uh, come on, focus on this, focus on this. Go, go, go. <laughs> anyway, no, 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 maybe not. Anyway, right, uh, if I bend this thing over and over again, it's going to, so it's repeated loadings. I'm bending it out and cutting myself on screen as well because it's, Weirdly splintering. It's strange metal they've used in this thing. If I keep bending it over and over again, uh, eventually, I mean, firstly, it warms up. But secondly, eventually, it's going to. It doesn't take very long uh, if I didn't keep stabbing myself with this safety clip. It's always easier with a paper clip rather than a safety pin. Um, anyway, here we go. I'm bending this thing, and I'm just going to do it down here because I'm giving myself lactic acid in my arms, and I. There we go. Let's just do this. Eventually, it's going to... This is a very strong paperclip, folks. Always plan ahead. Always do a test. There we go. It's, I can feel it going now. Oh, I picked the thing that's very difficult to manipulate. But it's going to go now. It's going to go. There. Oh, come on. Uh, what I need is like a uh, sometime, sometime later little clip to just sort of drop in. Um, and... Well, a lot of stuff has just fallen off it. My fingers are covered in metal, but it's actually remarkably resilient. There we are. Anyway, you... Oh, golly. It's, it's quite impressive. This, Someone, quick, quick. Just... Yeah, I know, right? It's here. I'm going to put an engineer break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there we are. I feel it going. It's going. Come on. Come on. Safety pin. You get the point, folks. Uh, always plan ahead uh, with your experiments but you can see this metal here on my finger you can see it uh, there we are there we, there we go there's, there's metal on my finger anyway so it is disintegrating and that disintegrating is fatigue cracking <laughs> this is, ah there we go so now I've got huge numbers of holes and blood on my fingers um, don't try this at home folks uh, we're going to <laughs> a small face. So that's fatigue cracking, um, and it's just about repeated loading. So the repeated loading eventually it will um, it will snap. Um, so uh, cyclic repeated loading. That's it. Um, so you can have loads changing in size, opening, closing, uh, loads, all sorts of things cause fatigue cracking. Huge numbers of things, um, and generally you've got components often are, suffer a lot of repeat cycles. So things like uh, you can also, you know, you can heat something up and cool it down can result in fatigue cracking. It doesn't have to be a mechanical, it doesn't have to be an applied mechanical load. You can just heat something up, cool it down. So things like brake discs, um, 
Uh, high risk areas such as wheel set axles and um, train systems and components are inspected at suitable intervals. Uh, so those things that get fatigue that could fatigue get inspected frequently to um, ensure that everything's functioning within normal parameters, um, which is fine. Good. So you get daily checks, uh, which looks like uh, impact uh, damage, damage to impact, uh, damage to paint, which is a good indicator of something uh, that could be a problem. Um, a formal visual inspection of underframe mounted equipment is undertaken to identify damaged paintwork, impact damage, holes, cracks, corrosion on a six monthly basis. So get different frequencies for different kind of um, assessments. Um, so uh, people are saying on, on audio only form that me trying to snap a safety pin uh, will not have been helpful. It's a good, well, the thing, is I, the thing that was close to me that I bet would have broken more quickly is this wonderful little uh, Soviet era pin badge. Which uh, none of you can see, which is which is here. Let's do this. I don't want to, This was the thing that was in my. Where is it? There it is. Look at that. Alice is playing her. Don't look at my dreadful cuticles. Alice is playing uh, the Soviet anthem right now. Anyway, um, uh, it's a really cool pin badge that I spotted in a little knickknack shop uh, the other day. Anyway. Um, so I'm digressing horribly. Basically, you've got this this, this analysis looking at, at the formation of these cracks. Um, so you can see that the crack that was tolerable was about 0.6 meters, 620 millimeters. Uh, that was tolerable, um, and it found that stress levels within the weld material um, would uh, would remain below the value for immediate failure of the weld. Um, so that would you get cracks up to 280 millimeters. So Basically, proposed a max, maximum permitted crack length of 200 millimeters in the affected area for ro rolling stock domain in service. Okay, fine. Well, that's that's all fine and good. Um, there were uh, so yeah, okay, lots and lots of stuff there. So uh, stuff about standards. We don't need to look at that. Maximum loads transmitted into the body. Fine, fine, fine. Testing the rolling stock. Um, so yeah, so fine. So there's all this testing that took off. This is talking about the testing that happened. Normal testing as part of the introduction of the trains. Um, but then additional testing as well, so the, the, the testing on the, great, the East uh, Coast and Great Western main lines, um, which resulted, as we said, in the yaw damper forces that were higher than, than expected, and the anti-roll bar loads were also higher than um, expected as well. So uh, this is quite interesting that these two things happened. So engineering practice deems that fatigue life is acceptable if a material can withstand up to 10 million, uh, 10 million, yeah, 10 million, 10 to the 7 cycles at peak load, and Hitachi's design relied on this principle. Um, it's interesting that we talk about that practice. It's not a practice that I could immediately cite ever having practiced, but there we are. Apparently, apparently I know that. <laughs> um, it's noted that the actual fatigue experienced by the vehicle body shell consists of a range of loads with differing frequencies and magnitudes, and the accepted figure, 10 to the 7 figure, represents a simplification of an overall level of fatigue, which is used to enable fatigue calculations to be undertaken. Fine. Um, but, but the Hitachi explained to the R that the recently collected data suggests the vehicles are exposed to a higher level of fatigue than that allowed for in the design, and went on to say that further investigation is required to understand the causes of this, which might include wheel wear and track quality. Interesting. Are they saying that it's our crap track? Is that a hint that it's something to do with track? Hmm, there we go. Um, and wheel wear. Those are both uh, blame other people type things. But I don't think that's actually what's going on here. That's their genuine observation. Anyway, um, so yes, uh, there's this looking at the fact that um, acceleration was sufficiently within the design values that there was a satisfactory margin to accommodate potential impact of wheel wear. So then we go to track characteristics. Track characteristics inevitably affect loads experienced in service. Hitachi is therefore considering whether the track specification is the reason that the load values observed during te recent testing exceeded those defined by the design standards. This includes assessing the potential relevance of factors such as rail roughness, the characteristics of gaps, points, switches and crossings, and the profile of the railhead. There we go. So that's that's ongoing. Um, we don't, we, I, don't, I didn't have any specific update of that from um, uh, from the ORR. Uh, you did hear 620 millimeter, David's. Uh, yes, 620 millimeters is a very long crack. Agreed. That's an enormous crack. Um, Hitachi has continued to consider whether there may be other features of the operation environment. Okay, fine. So um, we're going to get into the, into the meat of this now. The conclusions of Hitachi's technical review was that um, the greater fatigue load um, was was um, going through the yaw damper and the ARB, and that's why the fatigue cracking was happening. And the degree of fusion in the weld between the bolster and the car body was likely to be a factor. 
So we need to then think about what weld fusion is. Uh, oh golly, well hopefully someone someone in here will, uh, in, in this report, will then go on to explain it. So, um, so this is where we get uh, the next steps sort of situation. Uh, ORR are recommending that the industry should conduct further work to identify the reasons for the high levels of fatigue loading experienced by the rolling stock. The Hitachi design was compliant with the, 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 with, with the industry standards, so that means that the standards aren't right. That's how, you def that's how you update standards, by realizing that they're inadequate, that they aren't actually capturing all load cases, or for example, that you, that you expected to see. Um, so that's, that's going to be massive cross-industry collaboration to work that out. Uh, and looking at track infrastructure, I mean, our track inf our track quality standards are perhaps still a bit, um, yeah, oh, uh, yes, uh, track quality standards uh, are maybe not quite as good as they are elsewhere. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, we inspect frequently, but we allow, we, we probably tolerate slightly more shonky track than, than others do. But then we, you know, other places, less, more, this, this, that. Uh, Tom is pointing, we're talking about how well the two bits of metal have mixed for, for fusion within a weld. Um, uh, thanks, Tom. Very helpful. We didn't anticipate how rough British track is, is the euphemism that Tom is pointing out. Yes, agreed. Uh, Michael Gove level of crack, asks Gareth Williams. Anyway, um, next steps, assurance of weld quality. Uh, Hitachi should carry out a formal review of the effectiveness of their processes for welding when the component geometry is more challenging. You remember how fiddly that little bit of metal work looked? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't a nice, simple, linear weld space. It was like in, out, left, right, little T-shapes, very fiddly. Um, Right, now we get to talk about stress corrosion cracking. This stress corrosion cracking is what was in that lifting plate, the jacking plate. Um, SCC, as it's going to be uh, compressed to in this report, is a mechanism by where, uh, whereby uh, cracks develop in susceptible materials when they are exposed to a specific corrosive environment while subject to mechanical stress. So the combination of the mechanical stress and a corrosive environment allows you to get stress corrosion cracking. Um, the stresses involved in SCC are usually significantly lower than those involved in mechanisms where the stress alone is sufficient to cause cracking, thus making certain materials susceptible to cracking under conditions where the mechanical design would otherwise be sufficient. Um, so uh, stress corrosion cracking has been likened to the fire triangle where fuel, heat and oxygen must all be present for combustion to take place. If any of the three elements are missing then there is no fire. In the case of uh, SCC, the three elements are the susceptibility of the material, the specific corrosive environment, and the mechanical stress. So material, uh, corrosiveness, stress, those are the three. Uh, material, corrosiveness, and stress. And, and, and get those three right and you will get stress corrosion cracking. Um, so this is what they're saying here is that the susceptible material is the, is the, the milder aluminium, the 7,000, no. The harder, the stronger aluminium, sorry, the 7000 series, that's the, that's the, the higher strength aluminium alloy. Um, the, the corrosive environment for the material is one containing chlorides, i.e. salty water, um, uh, particularly in coastal areas and during cold weather when salt-containing products are used to manage snow and ice. Stress is obviously a bit, bit kind of stresses, these things are always getting stressed, fine, but notably can introduce during the welding process when fabricating assemblies containing, uh, when fabricating stuff assemblies containing the susceptible material. So this, this, is, this is where the rabbit hole becomes more and more intriguing. Um, so during the visual inspections, uh, cracks were found in the lifting plate. Uh, inspection of those lifting plates uh, identified additional affected, uh, affected units. They were then held back from service. Uh, so there we go. Um, yeah, they confirmed that the crack mechanism in the, in the lifting plate is uh, stress corrosion cracking. Uh, so the, the TWI also identified that the, that, that 7000 series aluminium alloys has a greater susceptibility to stress corrosion cracking than other aluminium alloys. Um, and that can be heightened by the thermal effects, um, uh, or, so basically the welding process, which gives rise to meta metallurgical changes within the alloy. So that's usually not a realignment of crystals or perhaps the formation of imperfections within the alloy. Uh, alloys are, are a crystalline matrix so you get different crystals all interacting different crystals of the materials um, and generally with an alloy you want it to be as homogenous as possible uh, someone who's a metallurgist can correct me on that but generally you want it uh, homogenous as possible so the the, the, the way that the, the behaviors are as uniform as possible um, and uh, yeah so you can call those those crystals you can call them grains uh, for example and 
Yeah, so essentially what, what it's saying is that when you when you treat when you heat treat, sometimes you heat treat to create certain crystal patterns. So for example, if you heat treat rail head, that can create a harder steel. So you can you can treat the, the surface of the steel to create perlite or, or bainite, which are names of alloy crystal on, on, on steel. Uh, you know, it's ostensibly the same material, but it's or the same mixture of materials, mixture of, 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 of alloys. Uh, you know, carbon and steel primarily, but also other things like manganese and blah blah blah. Uh, those those crystals form. You can heat treat them and change them. But sometimes you can, you might not heat treat them, but you might inadvertently be subjecting them to heat. Uh, and welding is an example of that. And so you have a heat affected area. And I believe that's what's being explained here. So the the heat from the welding, um, uh, then changes the that kind of arrangement of crystals or grains. Um, yes. So so what happened there? The susceptibility is heightened by the thermal effects of the weld. Um, by the alignment of the grain within the material, so the, the inherent nature of that, of that, the crystalline nature of that um, alloy, and the fact that they've then machined the rolled aluminium alloy sections to expose the boundaries of the grains, which essentially, if you've got, if you've exposed, it gets into deep metallurgy, but if you've exposed those, then they can potentially pull apart, unzip, and, and, and create a, a crack. Um, so... Uh, yeah, basically, because the UK is uh, the analogy I use for the UK, particularly to, to people who've uh, bravely decided to, to move here um, and ha weren't and kind of didn't grow up here, um, is that Britain is kind of like the the, the damp, potentially mouldy sponge that no one ever uses that's on the side of the sink. Uh, it's a very soggy thing; no one squeezed it out properly, and uh, as a result of that, the country is a very damp place. Uh, and often quite smelly as well. Uh, and so if you've got this, generally the UK is pretty damp, pretty humid. Um, that means that salt, you can get salty air pretty pretty rapidly because of the, the humidity, the rain, seawater everywhere because we're seawatery, you know, surrounded by the sea, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so if we can continue, you can see that the, basically the, the, the way that the, these cracks, so these cracks were forming, the way they were forming made it difficult to identify um, when it occurred, but the initiation, so the, the way that it forms, the way those cracks sort of form, uh, makes it difficult to identify when the cracking occurred, but the initiation was thought most likely to have occurred at the manufacturing stage. So the crack was actually created at, at when the train had been put together. Uh, that cracks, those cracks developed over time um, in, in, you know, in the UK, and they have developed, they've identified a correlation between age and, and, and extent of cracking and age but not extent of cracking and mileage which is interesting um so the mechanism is dependent on the grain structure material um so it means that propagation beyond the material of the plate itself is unlikely adjacent weld areas okay but well, this is a waffle and i'm, I'm not kind of but it's saying that, that that's it's quite localized so it's not a huge risk that that, that crack, the cracking doesn't present a huge risk other than the lifting plate falling off uh, apparently so there's lots of discussion here in, in mitigation, lots of welding chat. Mm. Yeah, Hitachi drew on its long experience with Shinkansen and Class 395 fleets when considering these risks. Um, uh, yeah, there we are. There haven't been any reports um, during the design process. There haven't been any reports of SCC, of stress corrosion cracking on the Shinkansen or the Class 395. So it's considered that the, the 395 was an appropriate design benchmark. Quite a reasonable, uh, quite a reasonable assumption, frankly. Um, so there we go. So, yeah, peening, peening, hmm. and weld buttering, those sound like wonderful things that I have no idea what they are, but they sound delightful. Peening and weld buttering, widely accepted methods for mitigating stress corrosion uh, cracking uh, risk. And they're being used as part of the ongoing repair work described below. However, since the, the finite element analysis, um, and this initial strain gauge testing of the of the trains didn't indicate high levels of stress in the relevant components. Hitachi at the time concluded that peening and weld buttering of all such components was unnecessary. Hitachi did, however, apply peening and weld buttering to areas of the train which were expected to experience high stress. They are peening and weld buttering. Explain in the chat, everyone. Um, so there you are. Uh, wonder if it could also be due to differential thermal expansion, 40 degree temperature change over a year and two different materials welded together. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe, Tom. Um, so they were looking at potential 
Uh, so there's a paint coating applied to help mitigate the risk of SCC. So basically, that's, that's getting rid of one part of the triangle, which is the corrosion, the, 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 the corrosiveness part. So if you apply special paint, it avoids the corrosiveness part, and you don't get SCC. So that, that you know, we're thinking this is a triangle. Oh, here we are. Um, here's the explanation of peening and weld buttering. Right, here we are. Lovely. Uh, peening. Residual stresses in welded components are modified by a process of mechanical treatment to remove the stress that must be present for SCC to occur, okay, and weld buttering, a layer of weld material is applied to the at-risk surface of the parent metal to prevent its exposure to potentially corrosive atmospheres. Well, there you go. Um, is that the th yeah, is it almost like brazing, that finish, the, the finish that you get with brazing, is that, I don't know, is that related? Uh, I'm not an, an expert in welding, but we're all learning together. Um, Copybooks, etc. Considerations concerning the alloy, the, the aluminium alloy. So the aluminium was provided by multiple suppliers. Uh, they're well-known alu aluminium alloy suppliers in Japan, uh, fine. Um, they test the chemical composition and strength before they're supplied to Hitachi. Um, and Hitachi gets a certificate. As part of its technical investigation, the Welding Institute has confirmed that the metall metallurgical composition of the components removed during its investigation is consistent with the relevant specification. Um, the aluminium is alloyed with zinc and magnesium, so aluminium and zinc and magnesium, sometimes with copper additions, producing higher strength wrought aluminium alloys. These can be these can beneficially be used in the car body design instead of weaker alloys, with the benefit of reducing the total weight of the vehicle. According to information provided by the Welding Institute, these additions can cause the alloy to, alloy to be susceptible to anodic dissolution or hydrogen absorption. Um, okay, so um, anod anodic dissolution, so that's wait, anode, anode diode, I can't remember which one's which, but essentially that's to do with uh, either negative or positive uh, sort of charge resulting in a, in, in a you know, dissolving or breaking up the, the material, or hydrogen absorption, so hydrogen being absorbed. Hydrogen get, is a threat to steel. We often used to get hydrogen flaws within steel when it was being made at Workington that were often the root cause of, of Tacho valves or of um, other fatigue cracks within rails. Um, yeah, Zandovich is asking is the corrosion so much higher in the UK than on the Japanese shoreline or in the northern Japanese islands that are snowy? It's a very, very good question. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer to that, and no, it doesn't seem to be in here. Tweet the ORR about that and see what they come back with because it's a very good point. You'd expect that to be the case in Japan as well, wouldn't you? Hmm, interesting. Um, very, very good question that I don't have a good answer for. Sorry, Xander. Uh, it's a very good point and one I should have thought of because you'd expect Japan to be similar. I don't know whether humidity is different, but though because Japan is also quite humid. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Very good question, Xander. Pester the ORR about it. Um, or Hitachi. I don't think Hitachi will reply. <laughs> uh, so, fine. Microstructure. Uh, I, I don't think... So that's talking about interatomic forces. Good God. That's, that's deep. That's real deep. We ain't going there. I mean, it's a kind of discussion. This page appears to just be a discussion about the, the kind of the aluminium, the forms of the aluminium extrusions, plates, forged parts, um, and yeah. So, so they 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 they're kind of going to avoid the use of seven thousand series aluminium when they could use uh, five thousand series alloys or perhaps six thousand series alloys. Um, avoid exposure to the environment of through thickness planes in the grain structure. Whoa, there you go. So that's to do with the alignment of the crystals in the steel, uh, which in turn are defined by the way you're, the direction you're rolling it, I suppose, to create that. The, you know, there, there are ways they can understand which direction the grains are going in. Um, I talk about using weld buttering. Uh, paint is often insufficiently reliable as a protection method, while the literature data is contradictory regarding the effectiveness of peening. So peening may or may not be useful, and paint may or may not be that, that great. Uh, anyway, so there's there's a little bit of further assessment happening, um, and they identified quite a few areas within the the three eight fives and the the class eight zero x and three nine fives that could be susceptible to stress corrosion cracking. So this is clearly a, there's an ongoing risk here about stress corrosion cracking, um, and you know places like the center pin base plate, uh, presumably that center pin, presume that center pin is referring is that the base plate is on the the. the uh, will be within the middle of the bolster, perhaps. Um, center sill bracket, not sure. Main transformer, former beam plate, uh, that presumably within the 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 power you know, kind of um. You know, what would that be? Transformer beam plate. Oh, all sorts of exciting parts. And then the yaw damper bracket, anti roll bar stiffener. Fine. 
Um, so they, that's where, so sorry, the odd upper bracket and anterior bar stiffener is where we were seeing the other cracking that was that was forming uh, of its own accord due to the excessive loading. So actually, I wonder if there's a combination. Well, they know they didn't identify a combination, but that that potentially could be a, com a combining factor to get even faster um, fatigue cracking there. So the root cause of stress corrosion. The conclusion was that this was caused. Um, uh, so this was caused by the use of the 7000 series aluminium, um, and in particular, plates exceeding 10 millimeters in thickness. Thicker material is particularly susceptible to stress corrosion cracking in a typical rail environment in the UK in circumstances where res residual welding stresses are present. So you get the residual welding stresses, soggy, salty air, and then uh, combine that with the 7000 series material. It's that's our, that's our, our triangle there, isn't it? Um, Oh, there's all sorts of interesting chat going on there. Right, fine. Uh, it's noted that the existing industry standards do not make provision for this risk, which is totally not, not considered. So that's interesting. So the next steps. Designers of rolling stock should understand the risk proposed by stress corrosion cracking and give it specific consideration when it can proposing the use of 7000 series aluminium components. So there you go. Uh, interesting. So that's the next steps. Um, and the industry should consider whether there needs to be a standard for mitigating stress corrosion cracking. Um, since that one does not exist at the moment, so there you go. So what have we, what have we got from that? We've learned that there are the two two areas that we're having cracking. One of them is because we're having additional um, loading and stress loading in the yaw damper and the anti roll bars, of which Hitachi believe is is coming from track condition, and, and, and so that's where they've come from. That so that's interesting. I, I kind of feel like that's a bit of an open one. I'd be interested to know. Well, what? Okay, that's. I suppose you have to limit the scope. You can't keep following it forever, but I'm just going. Well, why is why are the design of the anti roll bars and the yaw dampers not? Why was why was the design load, uh, expected design load lower than the the real loads? That should should always be the opposite way around. You should always design sufficient, um, uh, sort of uh, safety factors into that. So that, I'm interested in that. And I, I'm interested to, to to find out more about that. That that feels like a, a gap. Um, well, we'll yeah and. and so anyway, right, examination of the industry response. Let's see what we've got to say about the industry response here. So um, generally, th th we're going to go through this fairly quickly because I think possibly it's uh, not as instructive. No, yeah, maybe not quite as, not interesting, but not quite as instructive. Uh, so anyway, let's, let's whiz through. So um, fine, uh, let's see, there's... there's um, Back in March 2020, there was discoveries of, of cracks in an obstacle deflector support bracket on a Class 395. Um, cracks were identified while repairs were taking place following an incident that caused damage to the known co nose cone. Further investigation. Okay, da, da, da. So this is looking at, identifi at identification of the problem. So the issue here is... The, the, the issue that the RR have identified is... Well, it's not clear. They're not stating the particular issue. They just want to review it. Um, they wanted to review the quality of that process. Um, so they're just going to review and understand. So they've got identification of the problem. Uh, so they talk about how the problem is identified here. So lots of examples, case studies of how the problem is investigated and then kind of the timeline as well. Um, this is obviously you can get, if you want the detail, go and download the report. You can just Google it and download it from the ORR website. Uh, then, then the initial notification, so going through this, explain the timeline of that. Then the assessment of the safety risk, which we've kind of talked about already. That was kind of the previous state. Um, and then the withdrawal of the trains from service. And then the return of the trains to service. So we've talked a bit about the fact they established limits, safe limits, the, the visual identification of cracking, and then sent them out. Um, Abelio ScotRail found no yaw damper cracks, so no limit criteria were defined for the Class 385 units. Um, yeah, it's interesting that I just I want more detail as to why that the, the cracking was happening at the, the head of the yaw damper and the anti-roll bar. You know, is it is it the fact that it's not clear they haven't they haven't ex they haven't stated explicitly that that isn't because of Additional uh, load on the on the the underframe, but to be fair, that I think that was largely refuted. Um, yeah, it's I, I'm, I'm really irked by that the fact they haven't really gone and just explicitly found that out yet. But I suppose it's, it's, this is a fairly quick report, um, quick, useful, quick, but not necessarily completely exhaustive of the whole issue. So yeah. I, I'd be interested to know exactly why that is, and it does feel a little bit like they've deflected to track condition without understanding why, you know that. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, so then they refi So there's there's some information here about the fact that those inspection processes were refined. Uh, so using dye. I don't know if everyone saw that dye. It was quite often you could see the trains going around with dye where the the cracks were to sort of spot them. 
Um, that was always good. could see that stuff. Um, uh, yes. Um, other non-destructive testing for ch ch checking for su subsurface cracks. Um, so eddy current inspection is one. Uh, ultrasonics is another. I'm not sure if they used ultrasonics. Um, yes, yeah, so it looks like they were just using eddy current testing. Eddy current is, is arguably more reliable than ultrasonics because it can go through one crack and continue to, to measure through. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, and then destructive examination. Uh, destructive examination was carried out on cracked areas of two vehicles. The bulk, of mater bulk material of wells that contained cracks was removed in its entirety to allow lab examination of the cracks, including scanning electron microscopic analysis of the microstructure on the fracture face. Uh, measurement analysis of the crack geometry and chemical analysis of the constituents of the aluminium alloy. There we go. Um, so there's, there's destructive. So, so there we go. All that stuff. Data analysis, interim repair, the long-term technical solutions. So this is it, it, then is, is okay. This is evaluating what what that kind of what what the proposals were. I suppose this report is actually just listing off. It's more of a timeline, actually, isn't it? It's it's rather than actually coming up with a complete solution. It's sort of just describing that timeline and capturing what happened uh, for people to read through. It's almost a bit of a, a long read news report about what happened. But that's how it feels having read through it so far. Um, so uh, the, the, they looked at what they were going to do. Hitachi's permanent solution to address the fatigue cracking is to remove the affected part of the original body structure, including the longitudinal welds where the fatigue cracks have occurred, and the mountain brackets. The structure is rebuilt using a modified design. Um, an example is shown in figure 4.1 below that provides an unchanged interface with the yaw damper bracket and actually roll bar. Hmm. Um, okay. Uh, where's that figure? We're going to see it. Uh, leading and intermediate vehicles have different designs, so two options were developed for each uh, vehicle type to allow assessment of the effectiveness of the production processes for each, each approach. So they, they have different approaches, testing them to see which one's more uh, easier to do uh, and, and also uh, works. Um, yeah, but they could validate the approaches within service testing before they which working out which one to progress with. Um, all four options involved replacing the longitudinal well between the bolster and car body, removing the original ribs uh, webs, Welding stiffeners to the body side, welding a new bracket onto the bolster and body side stiffeners. Um, the modified designs were subject to fatigue assessments by Hitachi and Ricardo, independently of each other and using different methods. Good. Bit of evaluation of that. Oh, yeah, golly, okay. Uh, that is quite different. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to... That is quite radically different, yeah. Interesting. Um, let's, just, let's just go in and do... I'm going to do a quick thing. Let's do this. Uh, there we are. Uh, and I'm going to get the get the old get the old slide deck up here, uh, and uh, paste this here because we'll 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 I'm, I'm creating slides on the on the fly, but only because I think uh, let's let's just do this. I'm gonna, uh, if you're photosensitive, uh, cover your eyes now because I'm about to flick through the pages. I'm about to do it now. Uh, da -da 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 -da. We're going back up to the the other picture. Yeah, there we are. So we can see what the difference is in the in the in the design. I think that's uh, worthwhile and interesting thing to do. Uh, there we are. Let's do this and this. There we are. Lovely. Boom. Uh, there. I've done it. Done it. Very nice. Very very nice. Uh, let's do this and also do this. And I'm gonna then do this. This is worth. I promise this is worth it. It's gonna give us a nice little, uh, a nice little uh, comparison of the two, uh, which I think will make our life easier. We can compare the two different. Uh, the, the two, the two different designs, because I think that'll be quite interesting to just sort of see the two of them together. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Uh, let us do this again, and I'm going to just uh, what we got. Uh, we're going to uh, close your eyes again. I'm going to flick through. Uh, here we are. Do, 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 do. Get to that picture. There's the picture. So uh, they have to cut, cut, cut out the weld line, uh, machine, do all sorts of stuff. So a joint venture. This is interesting. This is where it gets interesting. A joint venture between Rolls Royce and Unipart Rail has developed a vehicle mounted three-axis milling machine that allows the task to be performed in a consistent and repeatable way. So basically a new blinking machine has had to be developed to enable this, to, to actually do this work. That's pretty substantial um, at Hitachi's cost, I would imagine. Um, yeah, so, um, so there we go. So that's fine. Uh, first modified design uh, was carried out on uh, Great Western Unit 802007. Oh, 007 was involved. Oh, woman. Uh, this is known as the first-in-class modification. Fine. Uh, lovely, lovely, lovely. On completion of the modification, the vehicles were fitted with strain gauges and subject to in-service testing without passengers. 
Uh, when the data had been analysed from the test operations, Hitachi selected the repair option to be applied across the fleets. So there we go. Preferred options characterised by stiffener plates on the outside face of the bolster. The alternative used stiffening ribs on the outer face of the body side plate. Um, there we go. So, uh, and we're going to compare those two options again in a minute. I've got the two little pictures up. So you can see the modifications are progressing. Um, but the programme of correcting all the vehicles is expected to be complete in 2028. Golly. Uh, yes, quite a substantial uh, period of time. Uh, yes, that's a long that's a long period to fix an issue. It really is. Crikey. Um, let's see. So, da, 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 da. 14 other areas have been assessed, and Hitachi has proposed there is no engineering justification for additional work. Remember, we listed off a few other places where they spotted the risk to, to, from stress corrosion cracking. Um, but they have identified 17 areas where, um, uh, yeah, sorry, 17 areas, three of those require rework to address the, the stress corrosion cracking work, but the rest don't. Yeah, the lifting plate, couple of support plate, and the yaw damp area on the bolster. Um, of the driving vehicles only. So that's interesting. Um, yes. So da, 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 da. that's all the 80Xs. But the 385s and 395s, what's happening with those? The related cracking identified in the 385 and 395s are being addressed in a similar way to the 80Xs. Uh, okay, so it looks like they're doing broadly the same thing. Um, and they, interestingly, they've suspended. So they were replacing all the obstacle defect, deflector support brackets. For, for, for if you remember that that original issue on the three nine fives, that's been suspended following the detailed assessment of SCC risks because uh, that the risks could be managed without the need to replace the bracket. Um, there we go. So there's a discussion about the long term management of that component. A majority of operators have concluded their lessons learned exercises and most of them have considered that their management system arrangements were sufficient and effective in managing the impact from the train cracks and subsequent vehicle stand down. Um, yeah, the, it should be noted that the vehicle stand down impact varied greatly between operators, uh, which depended on their reliance on the stock. Uh, many operators continue to regularly engage with Hitachi to understand and manage the effects of the cracks on fleet implement solutions. Where operators were part of the same overall owning group, this allowed greater collaboration between them and readily accessible access to a greater pool of technical engineering resource. Maybe they should all be part of one operating group. Mm. Anyway, uh, operators are continuing to engage with Hitachi on a frequent basis to continue checks. Okay, that's what. So, so actually, the conclusion of that is um, the operator's safety systems caught this. No failure happened out on track. There was no disasters. Not even a close call in terms of, you know, a, a, a component falling off and, and causing damage but no harm. Uh, so that's that's good. Communication between operators and Hitachi. Um, this is interesting as well. Operators noted that communication between Hitachi and themselves varied depending on contractual arrangements. Um, some operators have real-time access to SAP, which is the, the asset management system that Hitachi have. So that gives them real-time information about the, the trains and what they're feeling. Operators who do not have access to that system, though, believe it would be beneficial and improve effectiveness of their safety and insurance processes for fleet management. So they want access to it. One operator noted that they previously didn't have access to data from SAP due to their um, train service agreement, I think, with Hitachi. That's a TSA, that's TLA, that... Uh, they haven't done an FYI for it. Um, uh, for reasons unrelated to the work to address cracks, the same operator has now been given access to SAP, but this is limited to a single license, and the restricted viewing access does not meet the operator's needs. There we go. One operator noted a change in Hitachi's engagement since our interim report findings, and has since stated that Hitachi is slower to provide information, which is perceived to be filtered and sometimes contradictory. Interesting, okay. Another operator highlighted there was a focus by Hitachi mainly on the AT300 train class, but that Hitachi has subsequently made efforts to include the AT200. I mean, lol, another operator. You don't, that's, that's Scott Rail. The, the process of elimination is not hard to know who that is. Um, so, uh, lots of people discussing the forums that Hitachi lead and all this stuff. Fine. Oh, yeah, train service agreement. I was right. That is what TSA stands for. Fine. Um, okay, so fine. There's lots of stuff there. We were able to review two train service agreements which outline responsibilities for the maintainer owner operators. Um, they did that to understand whether there are any barriers to the sharing of information between Hitachi and other parties. We established that, the, that these agreements set out clear processes for the retention and exchange of information between maintainer owner operator. Whilst there are, they do contain some restrictions on disclosure, uh, the ORR don't consider that those uh, agreements would have present, prevented the prompt disclosure of maintenance and other information between maintainer, operator, and owner. 
So they don't think there's any um, anything in the review of those service agreements which precludes operators from having access to that asset management system. Uh, lots of people are saying uh, SAP sit and pray, sit and pray. <laughs> SAP is utter rubbish, says uh, Adam Evans, who's in the chat. Adam, you you can't say that in the chat. Not expect me to read it out. There you go. That suggests to me that you have access to SAP. But there you are. Uh, lack of access should not be a barrier to the exchange of information necessary for operator safety and assurance processes. Um, however, we consider it would be useful for all operators to have access to that system. So here we go. Internal communications within Hitachi. This is kind of this is kind of interesting. Um, right. During our view, we provided information on the effective flow of information internally at Hitachi Rail um, between the British division and the manufacturing team based uh, at Kasado in Japan. Uh, let's see. Uh, lots of internal meetings. Uh, uh, there are lots of briefing processes to ensure common understanding of all required changes to check some procedures uh, there we are there are perceived well-established relationships within Hitachi Rail's global organization making it easy and quick to source the necessary data information um, the team the Casado Design Authority team was mobilized within six hours of the decision being taken to withdraw the rolling stock from service the time difference uh, enabled Casado staff to provide information during the early hours of the UK day in response to questions raised late in the preceding UK day yeah that kind of is, is a thing that we exploit um, with exploit might well be the right word I uh, I dare say, but less so these days. Uh, we, we, we certainly um, make, the, make the most of that with our team. In, in Certainly uh, you know, the company I work for, Arcadis, have a team in Bengaluru in India, and we, we, we make use of that. The, the team, the design teams out there, uh, us making the most of the time difference is quite useful. So if they're leading on a bit of design, I can then check that design in the morning if they've finished in the evening. SAP, uh, Gareth Williams, is, the, the asset, is Hitachi's asset management system that some operators have access to, other operators don't have access to. Um, so that meant longer days, which is like effectively, which is which is obviously good for solving the problem. There was people traveling around as well internationally. Um, yeah, externally, many stakeholders perceived effective communication between the Hitachi teams and Casado. It was seen as being a positive element through the lessons learned exercises and was widely praised. There you go. That's a pretty good reflection on Hitachi's internal communications. Um, so the conclusions on the industry response. Uh, targeted checks for unexpected cracks in the vehicle structure are not normal practice in the rail sector. However, um, the cracks were identified before they developed to a level that resulted in harm, and action was taken well before any significant risk had developed of a failure that could compromise the safe operation of rolling stock. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's any. I don't think any of us are going to disagree with that. Um, I, this, this is. I do consider this to be a bit of a success story. Clearly, there's an issue. But actually, it looks like it, it, it is interesting to understand. I'm still curious about the design process. It's a str corrosion, sorry, SCC, corrosion stress cracking. No, stress corrosion cracking. Uh, understood, and and clearly there there sort of shortcomings there. But I think that it's that that process is make makes sense. But I'm still surprised at the the loading situation, um, uh, and. Yeah, I'm surprised at the loading, you know, the, the your damper anti-roll bar. That, that that feels like there's a little more to be uncovered on that front. Um, yeah. Generally, though, the conclusion uh, is here uh, is saying that um, uh, operators internally were, were well supported, uh, so that's fine. They resisted any early external pressures to get trains back into service before the correct internal procedures have been followed. That's good. Um uh, that's it. So that means that the safety, that, that's good because that means that's exactly what I want to read about safety culture on the railways. Obviously, there are going to be external pressures and indeed potentially internal high level pressures to get trains back into service. Those were resisted. That's good. The culture works. Uh, that's safety culture in action, folks. That's that's a good thing. Um, yeah, each operator implemented their own assurance measures. Uh, Hitachi fully co cooperated to, to, to carry out those assurance uh, activities. Yeah, I think the general the general conclusion is that 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 was that was good. That the generally the response that the industry response to this was good. It was a crisis, but it was good. However, there is a next step here, which is that industry should develop a process for responding to similar future cross industry crisis events. Agree terms of reference for meetings and appoint a strong independent chair who can maintain pace, focus, and ensure all voices are heard. So, what that worked really well. Let's create a process that makes sure that 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 response is it ha that the quality of response happens again for another any potential future crisis. I think that makes sense, and that's the end. Uh, just the, the terms of reference here and um, and the glossary, which uh, I, hopefully I caught any things that I was using. But there you are. That's that's a report. I think it's quite it's quite a good it's a good report. That um, I definitely am left wanting more. 
So I, if I'd read the report before asking or are the question, I might have chased up the specifics more. But we've got a few responses from RR. So, uh, well, before we do that, though, let's compare these two. I, I said I would. So you can see the difference. You've got, uh, in this one, you've got kind of this, this, uh, that's red on green, but you can, let's just, uh, let's get rid of that. This one this is the old type, uh, and you can sort of see the difference to the new type here, which looks, I mean, it does look beefier, but beefier is not necessarily better, but it, 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 it's, they are distributing those stresses differently. There's definitely a different load path going on here. Uh, so I can understand why they take that approach. This, this is definitely, uh, the, the, I can I can see how my engineering instinct I can sort of see how the load paths are going to be better here into into kind of distributed uh, if you like kind of distributed through because the force you'll be getting lots of loads those loads are going to be manifesting themselves largely as as up and downy sort of loads uh, so you know up up and downy loads um, and in this one those those are being f concentrated in in four locations uh, whereas here it's being distributed. Because uh, ultimately, this at this end, this this is redundant material, really. So it's being concentrated here, 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 here. That's kind of quite focused. Whereas here, it's being distributed far better. Uh, so so yeah, that the, the load paths will, will be far better. My my old engineering uh, instinct. Yeah. Oh boy, he thick. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, there we go. That, that, that's quite interesting. Uh, what has happened since? Well, uh, I spoke to the RR, and the RR gave us a few lines, so we can kind of pick through those RR lines. Thanks, Kenny, for, for getting that done, and thanks, Ian, for, for responding. Uh, the work attached is undertaken to resolve the problems is continuing, with the long-term modifications now being carried out on the first train. So we know that. We know that the, 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 that's, that's going to finish in 2028. We established that. ORR continues to engage with Hitachi, the train owners, operators, and technical specialists. We have not identified any need to intervene or to conduct our own investigation into any of the areas forming part of the wide range of rectification activities. So essentially, that's that's long speak for um, they're quite happy with how things are progressing. They feel like it's been res like uh, the, the solution has been identified and it is being progressed uh, quite sensibly. Um, they're not imposing a deadline for the response to the recommendations, as the personnel who would deal with those. Uh, recommendations are currently working on the solutions to modify the train, so they don't want to slow down the, the train modification. Uh, I don't know to what... Like, uh, fine, okay. I, I'll believe them when they say that, but some of those things, the responses feel like separate things. But anyway, I, I can understand... You know, I don't think we should wait until 2028 to get that done, but I can understand that at the moment there's a lot. there's still a lot of assurance process going on in terms of absolutely being sure that the proposed solution works so that they don't get to 2028 and realise that it doesn't work. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's it. Um, Gareth Williams, that's a very nerdy crown question. And I know that, uh, we haven't done currency natter yet. Uh, it's about crowns and, uh, <laughs> I'm going to read it out, but I'm not going to answer it. Will the RR be changing the crown in the O of their logo, seeing as we're now using the Tudor crown for, hash, for inverted commas, things, as opposed to the St. Edward's crown currently in use? Mind blowing, uh, Gareth. You're an, a, a marvelous nerd. Is how I'm going to describe you. That's uh, that's sensational stuff. Uh, any thoughts? I think we've kind of covered our thoughts on the move there. Um, Xander's reposting a thing he said earlier that I did spot but didn't read out, which is um, I presume the uh, network rail track measurement train will have provided more than enough data on rail roughness to um, compare to other countries and support development of new standards. Uh, yes, agreed. But someone has to do the the two plus two thing um, uh, in order to actually do the work to check that and i don't know are hitachi doing that work is someone doing that work hitachi risk if they did that work and found out the answer is that the, the gb's rails are no more or less rough than japan's then that may they may not like that so i don't know if they would be doing that work it'd be interesting to get a network rail however might have a, their reputation to defend they might do that work hmm. i'd be very interested i don't know if that work's being progressed maybe we'll ask the orr if that's happening um now that we know that we can maybe do a follow-up and I'll, I'll refer to it in next week's episode anyway Oh, those be the thoughts. Um, get rid of my face. Everyone, that's a, that's a natter. Oh, God, it ran long. I was, thought that would be a nice nippy one, and it has not been a nice nippy one, has it? In fact, it has been a, another lengthy one. Uh, not super lengthy. Uh, podcast only, uh, read, sorry, audio only people listening. They're available on all your podcasts and platforms. Again, I'm behind on the upload schedule. I'm going to upload uh, last week's 
n now tonight i'll upload it while i'm um uh, i've downloaded the thing is i have to download it from youtube and youtube limits the rate of download of their episodes so it, it i have to i have to i have to know i'm going to be on my computer for like an hour for it to download which is why it takes a bit of time so um yeah i also ponder on the 620 millimeter long crack in a bracket david's uh, yes uh, very confusing uh, it's a, that's a hell of a crack on, on rails. I'm I get stressed out about twenty mil uh, a crack at twenty mil. That's that's uh, brown trousers moments. Anyway, um, what else? Patreon dot sl uh, dot com slash Gareth Dennis too uh, to support to, to to subscribe support this and get uh, bonuses. Oh, there haven't been many bonuses recently, uh, but there is about to be one tonight. So <laughs> you can come and join for that that tonight. I will post it on the Patreon as well, but it'll come up in the Discord. PayPal dot me slash Gareth Dennis. Uh, is where you can throw uh, a view slash loose change at me. And the chat that's been happening, gaffdennis.co.uk slash discord. So you can go to the discord and chat about that. Um, I think Masket might be gone, so I'm going to change that slide. And I will try and look into new merchandising opportunities, which <laughs> is a strange thing to say. Um, uh, Matt Reed, do I know what the shortest natter I've done is? Is it the Morpeth Curve one, possibly? Not sure. Um, Gareth Williams, knowing you're helping is enough reward. Well, you are helping. Genuinely, all the Patreon people, your your support enables this to happen. I, you know, I obviously dedicate a bit of time to these episodes outside of uh, the fact that I have a 9-to-5 job. I, I'm not like Jeff Marshall. I, I, this isn't my day job. I have a 9-to-5. Uh, soon I'll have a family to support. <laughs> Top of the little one to, 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 to support. So, um, Patreon people, you, you, you justify and allow me to continue doing this. You make... Not just the money makes me money this. I love doing this, but it, it helps to ensure that I can, uh, I can keep doing it. Um, uh, so, and Zandovich says that I do think the RR response on corrosiveness in Japan versus UK would be interesting. Yes, agreed. Um, so that's two things that we want to chase the RR. One is is anyone investigating the track condition uh, claim, and also uh, is anyone investigating the corros corrosiveness claim between uh, the UK and Japan? Absolutely. Um, Gareth Williams, you missed last week. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a little Gareth on the way. Yeah, there is. There is. Uh, well, I don't know if it's... Uh, we don't know whether boy, girl. Uh, we don't know the gender because uh, we're going to find out when uh, on the day. Anyway, uh, enough of that. Right. Next week. Finally, this this thumbnail that I've had in draft form in my thumbs for ages. We're finally going to do this episode next week. It's a, We've had a train one. Now we're going to have a structures one for the Bridges people. We haven't had a Bridges episode for a while. It's all the people who love Bridges. Um... Uh, episode 136 is going to be a look at probably all of Britain's movable railway bridges. So this should be a little interesting one. Um, you can uh, you can enjoy that. Yes. Uh, well, I don't. The baby might end up NB, but I don't know yet. Uh, Non-binary people are absolutely valid, Adam. Yes, correct. But I don't. I won't know that when the baby is initially born because um, uh, we. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll we'll see. But um, anyway, because it'll be it will be preoccupied with simply feeding and uh, and sleep, making sure the baby sleeps. Uh, whatever its gender. Um, so, anyway, that's next week's episode. I look at probably all of Britain's movable railway bridges. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. We, we, I collected up this pile of this, the, the pile of this ages ago, so I now need to go back through the Discord and, and, and search desperately for, uh, <laughs> for, for when, uh, for, for when I, I checked the list and everyone checked, uh, confirmed whether I was right or not. So I need to go back to that list and we'll list them off. Um, I'm amazed how many people are saying congratulations. I thought I said this in a rail now. I thought I said this. Did I say this in a rail now or did I say this in an, an engineer plays uh, episode? I can't remember. I thought I said this in a real matter. Oh, it's probably through Ros. This is just everyone who watched Ros's episode is giving away that you did or didn't um, uh, did or didn't watch the whole thing. There we are. You're all you're all exposing that the three hour beast. Um, yeah. Anyway, what about making sure that I sleep? Less relevant. So uh, that's that. After this episode, there's going to be... I don't know how long it's going to be, but it might be just a quick one. But we're going to just introduce you to this other map that I've been doing that's going to form a patron-only bit of uh, Transport Fever 2 fun times. Um, Viskorogusky uh, Vlakov, uh, which is um, uh, Slovenian, but uh, it's not necessarily in Slovenia. It's just a... Um, uh, it is just a... Anyway, it's fine. Can I cover the bridge over Preston Dock? Uh, lots of people saying congratulations. Uh, yeah, you're all lovely. Thanks, everyone, for saying congratulations. Um, uh, people can... You have to go back to the episode. You don't have to listen to the whole episode in one stint if it's three-plus hours, Gareth. That's fine. Anyway, some patron-only stuff, and it's going to be Transport Fever 2, and it's going to be uh, it, at half past eight, I think. So we're going to get that happening. Anyway. Oh. 
everyone, uh, thanks for watching. Um, that's uh, not a short one. I was hoping it would be a short one. It wasn't a short one, because this is real matter. But what I have to say is uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, all, it was Mental Health Awareness Day at the start of this week, wasn't it? On Monday. Um, and I just want to say to everyone, because a lot of us in here struggle with mental health, uh, take care of yourselves. Take good care of yourselves. Um, and I will see you next week. And I see, might see some of you in about five minutes. <laughs> so, cheerio, everyone. Cheerio. Cheerio.